AZPM still needs your help to build the new Baker Center for Public Media. If every AZPM member like you doubled their annual contribution, a new state-of-the-art facility will continue to bring public media to all of Southern Arizona. Donate now at azpm.org slash campaign. Welcome to The Buzz. I'm Christopher Conover. This week, a look into a case that deals with two conflicting abortion laws in Arizona. Since the overturn of Roe v. Wade, the abortion landscape in Arizona has confused both providers and patients. Before the law was overturned, the state legislature passed a bill which banned abortion after 15 weeks gestation. But once abortion protections were no longer guaranteed across the country, then-Republican Attorney General Mark Burnovich sought to lift an injunction on the state's pre-statehood law that bans and criminalizes nearly all abortions except for saving a pregnant person's life. The Arizona Supreme Court heard arguments this past Tuesday from the Alliance Defending Freedom. It's a firm representing the complainants and interveners, Dr. Eric Hazelrig, and the Yavapai County attorney. The court also heard from the respondents, Planned Parenthood, the Arizona Solicitor General, and the Pima County Attorney's Office. During oral arguments, Chief Justice Robert Brutnell questioned the complainant's lead counsel, Jake Warner, on the legislative intent of the 15-week law. If Dobbs had come down the way they anticipated, what they intended was this statute would make abortion possible up to 15 weeks in the state of Arizona. Elective abortion. Well, that's, why, that's why they passed this, isn't it? Well, Your Honor, we can debate the legislative intent here, but I believe the, the legislative text is clear. Uh, what the legislature did is that it uh, created an additional requirement on top of Section 13-3603. And the point but, I'm trying to make with you is I think that we, if, in fact, Dobbs had done what the legislature intended, that would not be the argument you'd be making. You'd be making this as constitutional because it allows an elective right to abortion up until 15 weeks. And, but what I'm suggesting to you is what it looks to me like is their intent was to create a statute that would accomplish that. After the arguments, we spoke with Jake Warner. I began by asking him to walk us through how he argued the state should interpret the two laws together. For over 100 years, Arizona has fully protected human life from the moment of conception. Of course, Roe v. Wade temporarily stopped that protection. Uh, but last year, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision in Dobbs, allowing states to fully protect human life again. Well, in the meantime, Arizona uh, reenacted Section 13-3603, otherwise known as the pre-row law, actually just reaffirmed that law as recently as last year. It said, uh, even though that we've uh, created um, all these other pro-life laws in the meantime, trying to protect unborn life as much as we could during the row era, we're not repealing the pre-row law. So now that row is off the books, it seems clear to me that the legislature uh, wants to uh, ensure that its pre row law can fully protect unborn life again. Vice Chief Justice Timmer had some questions for you about how these two laws work together and, and legislative intent. She specifically said when talking about the the 15 week ban that the legislature passed, why did they not just repeal the 1864 law or be more explicit? What did you tell her? with that line of questioning? I think my response was something along the line of, we can debate the art, but the, the grammar here is sound. Of course, um, you know, the reason we have lawsuits is when um, there is a debate over, over words oftentimes, and this is one of those examples. Um, but we believe that the legislature was sufficiently clear in the construction directives that it gave. Uh, there were three primary directives, and the legislature said, look, these, these new uh, laws, they do not repeal Section 13-3603, which is known as the pre row law that fully protects unborn life. And also, these new laws, they don't create a right to an abortion, and they don't legalize any currently unlawful abortion. So if you put these uh, pieces of the puzzle together, it suggests that the legislature is in no means trying to protect life less than it did before Roe, it's trying to protect as much life as possible while Roe remained in place. If the legislature does not repeal the 15-week ban and the court rules in favor of your clients, we end up with 
two laws, one that says ban abortions and one says after 15 weeks. I know the other side has argued that puts doctors in some due process jeopardy because they don't know which law to follow. How do you work that out? I think it's critical to look at the actual text itself. Um, It's easy to kind of summarize what the law might mean or might not mean. But um, uh, these laws can actually fit together uh, pretty easily um, because the 133603 law or the pre-row law, it um, uh, protects human life except to save the mother. So the termination must be life-saving to comply with Section 13-3603. After after 15 weeks, the uh, 15 weeks law (laughs) kicks in. And uh, it actually adds an additional requirement. There's an immediacy or an emergency requirement that that's not present in the pre-row law. So not only must the the, the termination be life-saving, it must be immediately necessary to either protect the mother's life or to prevent significant and irreversible bodily impairment. And I think the, the necessary premise underneath that argument is the idea that not all life-saving terminations are immediately necessary. And I was discussing this a little bit with the court yesterday um, because certain cancers uh, treatments, they can they can wait a day or they can wait a week or a month, sometimes even multiple months. And the same is true for certain cardiomyopathies. And, and given this uh, scientific truth, it's certainly true that logically these laws can fit together uh, quite well. It seems like potentially having both laws on the books, the way you're explaining them, could avoid the situation that we've seen play out in Texas in the last week or so um, with the courts and a woman seeking abortion and then politicians, elected officials stepping in and and getting involved. Yeah, Arizona has been doing its best to protect as much human life as possible. Uh, that's why before 15 weeks, the pre-row law ensures that the termination need to be life-saving. Uh, there's no like urgency requirement there. It just uh, is based on a physician's good faith judgment. This is not lawyers or other people trying to make the call. It's uh, it, The legislature has, has deferred to uh, the good faith judgment of, of physicians in making these calls. And then as the unborn child grows closer to viability, it just adds this immediacy requirement to make sure that both the mom and the unborn child is protected, which, which makes sense. As the as, as child is, is growing up, the state has a growing interest in ensuring that viable life is not destroyed. So from a legal standpoint, in case some of our listeners are not attorneys and, and don't follow the, the machinations of, of appellate courts and things like that, while the justices make their decision, and it didn't seem like they said, oh, we'll have a decision in a couple of days, we will just have to wait to see when they give it to us, the, the law as it stands, as you walked into court, is what still stands, correct? That's right. The injunction below is still in place. So uh, this case uh, began at the trial court uh, where the former attorney general, Mark Burnovich, moved to lift the decades old injunction that prevented the pre-road law from fully protecting human life. Well, once the case went up to the Court of Appeals, uh, the Court of Appeals modified the injunction to um, basically allow terminations before 15 weeks. And that injunction is currently in place while the uh, Arizona Supreme Court is deliberating over how uh, this case should be decided. Now, I hate to ask you to do this, but I'm going to ask you to do this based on the questions you were getting and the the, the feel of the room, if you will. What what do you think the justices are going to do? It's really tough to predict. I think what we saw in court yesterday was that the justices were very engaged they ask very probing questions, not only of me, but my friends on the, the other side. I think it was a very robust and civil conversation in the court yesterday. And it was really a, a wonderful for me to see because that civility flowed even outside of the courtroom with uh, people on both sides of the issue engaging civilly, even some becoming friends yesterday. Um, so uh, as much as I would uh, love to have a better idea about how the outcome might be, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that the Arizona Supreme Court is going to allow the state to fully protect human life. Again, life is a, is a human right. We think that's the right outcome here, but um, we won't know for sure until that decision comes down. If the court rules against you, is there an issue that can go to the U.S. Supreme Court or will this be the final word on this particular issue, no matter what our state Supreme Court rules? 
As I understand it, there are no federal issues remaining in this case. As it approached the Arizona Supreme Court, the issues were narrowed to be specifically one of statutory construction. So uh, this is the end of the road for um, for uh, whether to, to lift the injunction below. That was Jake Warner, the lead counsel for interveners Dr. Eric Hazelrig and the Yavapai County attorney. He's an attorney with the Alliance Defending Freedom. Pima County attorney Laura Conover is one of the respondents in the case. She, along with Planned Parenthood, is arguing to harmonize the near-total ban with the 15-week law. We spoke with Jill Habig, the founder of the legal nonprofit Public Rights Project, which is representing Conover in the case. We began by asking her how the Pima County attorney got involved. So Laura Conover is the top prosecutor for Pima County and a kind of underappreciated piece of abortion litigation, particularly when abortion is criminalized, is that often the DAs, the district attorneys or the prosecutors, are sued as part of lawsuits over those abortion laws because they are the folks who would be in charge of enforcing those statutes if they were going to go into effect. And so Laura Conover is actually a defendant in the original uh lawsuit, but is now is aligned with uh, the attorney general and other folks in the state that this 1846 law banning almost all abortions in the state is not in the interest of public safety and should not be allowed to go back into effect. So let's talk about this law. 1864 uh, territorial days for Arizona. When the legislature passed the 15-week ban, they said the the territorial law can stay in effect if the 15-week ban doesn't go into effect. Some people have said, oh, that was just really bad lawmaking, if you will, from from an academic standpoint. Others have said, oh, no, that was exactly what they meant to do. So which is this, bad lawmaking that creates this confusion of two competing laws or very purposeful? Well, I think actually this case is relatively legally straightforward because Arizona has had 50 years of lawmaking about the ins and outs of abortion regulation in the state all assuming and very specifically providing for some form of abortion. And Arizona has even regulated recently up until the last couple of years on this front about the terms of a 15-week abortion regulation, health emergencies after 15 weeks, et cetera. And so as a legal case, we think it's relatively straightforward that those more specific regulations should easily trump a centuries-old law from before Arizona was even a state. We're talking about a law enacted during the Civil War when women certainly could not even vote on on such a law, and Black people weren't even considered a full five-fifths of a person under American law. And so to bring back a law that is so broad and so old and to have that override much more specific much more recent regulations in Arizona, we think would be kind of upending standard legal principles. And that's what we've asked the Supreme Court. And I think it's notable that Arizona did not do what some other states did, which was explicitly pass a trigger ban or another, you know, a zombie law that explicitly said, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, this law will go into effect. Other states have done that. Arizona did not. And so we think this case is legally relatively straightforward, and we hope the Arizona Supreme Court will agree. The opposing counsel in this says that the two laws, the 1864 law and the much more modern 15-week ban, um, actually don't conflict with each other because the 2022 15-week ban doesn't explicitly say that abortions are allowed until 15 weeks. From a legal studies standpoint, does that argument hold any water? 
Honestly, I think that's hard to accept with a straight face, given the statutory framework in Arizona law. As we've seen in other cases, you know, Public Rights Project has been part of litigation across the country, uh, attempting to overturn and limit state criminal abortion bans. And we've seen the effect of these kinds of draconian laws in other states. You may be aware of litigation happening in Texas right now over fatal fetal anomalies where a woman who is experiencing pretty severe pregnancy complications, uh, her health and fertility is threatened, is forced to actually go to court and litigate whether she can even get the health care that she needs. And so that's the kind of situation that Arizonans would be facing if the Arizona Supreme Court allows this uh, 19th century law to take effect again. Well, and that Texas case became even more complicated when the court ruled she could get an abortion, but then politicians got involved and said that they would prosecute any doctor who basically upheld the court order. And I understand now the woman has said, well, I've got to leave the state because her health is on the line also in that case. Absolutely. It's really a horrific example of what can happen when these all out abortion bans take effect because politicians don't actually understand how pregnancy works, how miscarriage works, how uh, even the just the science of abortion works in terms of the procedures involved. And so we see when politicians try to get into the nitty gritty of who is allowed to receive health care and who is not, it, put doc- it puts doctors and patients into an impossible position where a doctor has to, instead of taking care of their patient, they have to call legal and get approval to provide the health care that they are trained to provide and want to provide. And so that's just not a place that any modern country should be in. The Dobbs decision left abortion up to the states. So, okay, Arizona, Texas, everybody else can can make their own laws. Do you see this case not only, no matter how it's decided, somebody trying to take it to the Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court accepting it? Because, of course, you can go there, but the Supreme Court doesn't have to take it. You know, anything is possible. If I've learned anything as a lawyer in the last few years, it's to never fully predict what any court is going to do in this landscape. But I do think that it's certainly possible that the Arizona Supreme Court will have the final word here because this really is an issue of interpreting Arizona's law, Arizona's statutory framework, Arizona's constitution, and those sorts of things. And so I think it's certainly possible that the Arizona Supreme Court will have the final word. If the state Supreme Court, when they rule on this, decides to go with the territorial law, which is basically the outright ban, but Arizona voters end up getting an opportunity to vote on a constitutional amendment that would allow abortion in the state, are we going to end up right back in court or because this is constitutional and voter approved, that will be the final word? Well, uh, I think it's definitely possible that all roads lead back to state courts right now, uh, given Dobbs and the the fights that we're seeing playing out back in in state courts across the country. We were part of litigation in, in Michigan last year, for example, over their uh, old historic criminal abortion ban. And so I think it's certainly possible, depending on the ballot measure, language, uh, and how voters weigh in next year, that we could be back in state court. But I do think it's notable that every time since Dobbs, every single time voters have had an opportunity to weigh in on abortion rights directly, they have voted in favor of abortion rights. However, part of the reason why we're in the Arizona Supreme Court is that we think it's a year is way too long to wait for people to have access to health care. And so even if, and I hope Arizona voters do weigh in next year, looking to broaden abortion protections in the state. In the meantime, there are tens of thousands of women who may become pregnant, who may have pregnancy complications, who may have unwanted pregnancies. And so What we really see our role as is really exhausting every avenue to protecting people's access to health care. 
until the voters have an opportunity to weigh in directly. All right. Well, thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you so much. That was Jill Habig, the founder of the legal nonprofit Public Rights Project. We end the show with Dr. Gabrielle Goodrick. She's the founder and medical director of Camelback Family Planning. For more than 20 years, her clinic has provided abortion services to Arizonans. Dr. Goodrick started our conversation by recalling what happened in Arizona when the state was dealing with both laws. We had just had a two-week ban here, and then we heard that they were going to not enforce the 1864 ban. So we immediately got to work. Um, We called patients that had been canceled. Um, You know, we got right back into it, but we were also short-staffed because of the confusion. Patients still didn't really know if they could get care in Arizona. So there was a lot of um, confusion, but we did try to get back to providing medical care. But again, there were definitely, um, at that point, you know, it was unexpected. And so immediately started hiring staff and trying to, you know, get everyone trained and provide care again. The appeals court sided with Planned Parenthood in December, so a year ago. um, And there were some caveats in their ruling uh, how uh, allowing the 15 week ru- law to be the one in effect at that point. So, the last year, what's the last year been like? As people say, but wait, there's this 1864 law, there's this new law, there are court cases. What's the landscape like out there for you as a provider and for patients? Well, I think for us, um, we have felt fairly secure, especially with the election results in Arizona in November of 2022 with Katie Hobbs um, being elected and the um, Democratic uh, Attorney General. Um, So that felt good and safe. And so once the court said, you know, we're going to enforce the 15 week ban, but not enforce the 1864. I mean, so for the last year, we've been providing care up to the limit and um, kind of had a little quiet time and grace period. I mean, this is kind of the first event that's happening that could affect that, I think. So I was kind of living in a little bubble until different media people have been reaching out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. (laughs) You know, it's almost like PTSD. Uh, The idea that um, they could then reverse and go back. And I think for patients, um, I don't think they know a lot about the details of it. Because again, last year at this time, they weren't, they didn't have an unplanned pregnancy. So they weren't really thinking about anything. And until a patient is in that position, then it's like, okay, can I do it or not? Like they don't, really bother themselves with the politics and the nuances of what could happen. It's like, what can I do today? Where do I go? What do I have to do? It's really interesting that you say that because obviously those of us in the media are very aware of it and very aware of all the nuances and this court case is coming, that court case is coming. You as a doctor are aware of it. But as you said, a lot of other people aren't necessarily aware of it because it's not affecting their day-to-day lives. Right. And that's kind of, I think, why a lot of people, when they're even asked about their position on abortion, you know, those answers are hypothetical. You know, those answers are, I'm against it or I'm for it. But when you're actually in a situation, that unique situation that that patient is in with an unplanned pregnancy, all bets are off. (laughs) You know, it's your body, it's your choice. And no matter what they felt beforehand, you know, they're going to be making the right decision. And they're the best person to make that decision. And most people think that it will never happen to them. When it happens, it's always a shock. And then it's like, oh, shoot, I think 16 states have a ban. So it's not fiction or fear. It's, It's reality. And And we certainly lived it last year when a total for my clinic at Camelback was four weeks of not being able to provide care. But I know it was much longer in other clinics in the state where they were closed from, you know, almost half of last year. When you were allowed to reopen, 
for abortions, did it, for lack of a better term, come right back? Or was there a slow ramp up? Are people still... What what are you hearing from patients? As you said, they're not necessarily paying attention, but there are 16 states, and then we have things going on in Texas, and now this case. You know, what what happened with the business end of this, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, a medical office. So you have to imagine, you know, I have employees, I have bills, I have rent, I have mortgage, whatever, and those expenses continue. And when you don't know if you're going to be open tomorrow, it creates a lot of stress. I definitely lost employees because of the stress of not knowing. I mean, we can look back on last year and I can say, okay, you know, we were open those days, closed those days, but we didn't know, you know, when we were closed, we didn't know when we'd be able to open. And then we opened and then we were waiting for the ruling in September. We didn't know what would happen. Would we close? Would we open? And then when we closed in September, I didn't think we'd be able to reopen until after the election. We didn't know what was going to happen. And then when two weeks later, we could start again, you know, it was a pleasant surprise, but in some sense we were like, okay, it was almost like we had adjusted to a new normal. Like, okay, we're not going to be able to provide. Let's see what we can do, how we can help patients, what we need to do. And then it was like, nope, stop. Oh, back to regular. You know, <laughs> it was, I don't think any other physician or medical practice could, I mean, a lot, well, a lot of clinics didn't survive. That was Dr. Gabrielle Goodrick, the founder and medical director of Camelback Family Planning. And that's the buzz for this week. You can find all our episodes online at azpm.org and subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Buzz Arizona. We're also on the NPR app. Paula Rodriguez is our producer with production help from Desiree Tucker. Our music is by Enter the Haggis. I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for listening. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.